everybody. It's Jamie McCarthy here, your host of the Modern Merchant Podcast. Uh, today, we've got Brett Curry on. He's the CEO of OMG Commerce. Hey, Brett. Hey, what's up? Um, so OMG Commerce, you guys are uh, an e-commerce marketing agency. Um, if you don't mind just kind of diving right into introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about you know, how OMG Commerce sort of came to be. Absolutely. So so I am a, a marketing junkie from of old, right? I remember as a teenager, young teenager, liking infomercials, right? Which is such a weird thing. Yeah. I would watch like the Ginsu knife commercials or other commercials and just be mesmerized. And, and I like the salesmanship of it. And I always thought I was, you know, interested in sales. And I did get into sales right after college. But uh, so always loved marketing, always loved ads started doing some radio sales and TV and then some SEO. And anyway, bu- built this agency 2010 with a business partner, Chris Brewer. And so we then grew and decided, hey, we love e-commerce. And I guess about 2012, really fell in love with Google Shopping. So I started writing about Google Shopping, speaking about Google Shopping, and then you know things kind of exploded. So we're a team of about 60, uh, closer to 65 actually, and and we help great e-commerce brands accelerate growth. And we primarily do that through Google, search, shopping, YouTube, and then Amazon. And uh, yeah, we love taking great brands that have great stories and then helping them grow faster. I love that. And that's always you know, one thing that you hear that, you know, newly emerging brands really kind of struggle with, right? It's that, you know, it's scaling, it's really making sure that they're positioning themselves, you know, you know, correctly, right? There's a lot of, uh, you know, I try to stay away from like the LinkedIn gurus, right? There's a lot of information out there and it can be super overwhelming. So I think, um, you know, obviously, you know, dialing in the marketing is, is, um, you know, super strategic. And I think it's super important to actually let the pros who do it best to kind of take over for you. Yeah, um, and yeah, and totally. And, and you know, one a couple of things that are happening. One, ad costs are increasing, right? The the level of overwhelm for customers is at an all time high, right? So we're being bombarded with messages all the time. So to to break through the clutter and to do so in an affordable way and to turn that that scroller, that viewer, that that shopper into an actual customer is difficult. And so certainly people can do it. It's not rocket science, uh, but, but it is more challenging now than it has been in the past, but there's still more opportunities now as well. So it's, it's a bit of a, a, a pros and cons there for sure. Right. And when you say opportunities, are you referring to just so many different like channels now that you guys have, you know, the ability to, to market on, right? Yeah. So many, so many challenges. And, uh, so, so many challenges. There are challenges too. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> many opportunities. And even though like privacy issues are real and, and changes, you know, post iOS 14, which a lot of marketers have PTSD now, thanks to iOS 14, just changed the game for us. There's still really interesting ways you can target that, you know, if we were to, to go back in, in the day to when I first started in marketing, like in the early 2000s, right. it would have blown my mind to know the type of targeting we have now, right? So on, on YouTube and Google, right, you can, so on, on YouTube, as an example, you can target people based on what they've been searching for recently on Google and on YouTube, right? So if I sell a hair product, if I sell like a, a concealer for hair, like touching up roots, I can, I can target people that have recently searched for how to touch up gray roots on my hair, right? So, so I know someone is interested right. in what I have to sell. That type of targeting used to not exist. And, and because it's Google's data, Google owns that data, it's not going to go away. You can still target those people through Google's platforms. So that's pretty awesome. So there, there are just more opportunities than there used to be. And even though we are a little bit bummed post iOS 14, there's still plenty of opportunities to, to scale. And so I noticed on your website specifically too, Brett, um, you guys refer to like your AMP strategy. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming that ties in a little bit to that. Can you explain to us, you know, what is AMP and, and how is it different from other ad strategies? Sure. So AMP is an acronym and it just sounds cool. And we, I want to make t-shirts. I'd like to get some tattoos that say AMP. Uh, that That's in the future. We'll see. But basically it stands for accelerated marketing portfolios. And so we're all about accelerating growth. But the idea behind this is I think there's this real danger. Uh, a lot of uh, you know good intentioned marketers and brand owners 
approach digital marketing and they, they approach it with laser-like focus and say, hey, we, we have to hit this return on ad spend or we have to get this CPA, this cost per acquisition or, or CAC, customer acquisition cost. Mm-hmm. And we're laser focused on that. And I like that and it's not wrong, but w- w- when people get into trouble is when they say, hey, we need to hit a, a 3X return on ad spend. And then they try to apply that same metric to all of their channels, right? They want YouTube to be at a 3X. They want top of funnel Facebook to be at a 3X. They want search and shopping to be at a, three, a 300% uh, percent return on ad spend. And that's just not the way it works. So uh, two analogies that I'll give you really quickly that I think will help. Uh, one is that of a, a portfolio, right? And that's why we call it this. So really you wanna look at your campaigns in total. And yes, mm-hmm. you wanna measure them individually, but you want to more look at the total impact, right? Because campaigns are not islands. Campaigns work together, right? You, you do more with YouTube. That's going to increase what you do with search and shopping and organic and direct traffic and all of that. You spend more on Facebook top of funnel, same thing. Going to have a lift in other areas. So I'm a, are you a sports fan, Jamie? Do you like sports? Oh, absolutely. Go Jags. So what's your <laughs> Go Jags. Interesting. Yeah, it's been a yeah. rough, rough life. <laughs> it's been a rough life. So, so I'm a, I'm a Chiefs fan uh, from Kansas City. So it's bright days, bright days right now for, for Patrick Mahomes, right. the boys. I'm going to use a basketball analogy, though, because I think it's a little bit easier. So, uh, right. but, but it's the same would apply to football. So I'm a big Chicago Bulls fan from back in the day, like Jordan yeah. Jordan era, yep. the best, you know? <laughs> so you could look at that team. So the, the, the Jordan, Pippen, Rodman, that team, if we were to look at that team and, and we were to look at Dennis Rodman and say, you know, he scored four points last night. I think we need to bench him, right? He only scored four points. Jordan scored 40. Rodman scored four. We got to bench Rodman. Uh, someone who knows basketball will be like, well, that's crazy. Rodman got 20 rebounds and he played amazing defense. I'm like, he's a really valuable part of this team. Right. So you have to have the same mindset when you look at your campaigns. Not every campaign has the same objective. Not every campaign has the same strength, right? YouTube at the top of funnel, you got to kind of consider what people are doing when they're on YouTube, right? They go to YouTube to watch something, even if it's a cat video and they're wasting time, they're still there <laughs> to watch the cat video, not click on your ad. Or... They're there to watch a how-to video or, you know, how to how to ask somebody out or how to solve this math problem or whatever. They're, they're there to do something specifically. So your ad was not on their agenda. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, them to click on your ad and buy right away, that's a big ask, right? But there have been so many brands that have built been built on the back of YouTube, brands like Purple Mattress and Squatty Potty and Poopery, and, and the list goes on and on. But... If you were to look at YouTube and say, YouTube should have the same performance as Google Shopping or as branded search or as remarketing, you're going to be disappointed all day long. But if you look at it and say, I know what YouTube's job is. YouTube's job is to get a view and to lift every other campaign lower in the funnel, right? Or to to get someone to visit my site and then we'll remarket to them and close them. Uh, So that's where you want to look at it like like a team right? Where you're measuring, we still want to hold each campaign accountable, but we want to mm-hmm. measure it according to its strengths, right? We don't want to measure Rodman based on his, his scoring ability. We want to look at his rebounds and his defense, right? We don't want to measure YouTube just by its direct conversions, but by its overall brand lift and by uh, and some direct conversions as well. So that's, that's the idea. It's, it's a smarter campaign approach and then a smarter way to market or a smarter way to measure actual performance. Got it. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, you wouldn't just tell Rodman, hey, sorry, you're not going to get this championship yeah, ring, yeah. right? Hall of Famer, like <laughs> yeah. he's one of the greatest players Forget of all time, it. but didn't score, right? But that's fine. Like he was a savant and, and a genius in other areas. So Yeah, I love that. And that's actually, you know, kind of leading into one of the questions I, I wanted to ask you is, you know, as far as KPIs are concerned, in addition to just like revenue, is there anything else that you are tracking to help determine, you know, if your strategy is successful or if you, yeah. you need to tweak or change some some of your yeah. strategy? For sure. So I, I think, you know, there there's not like a single metric that, that right. is the metric to go to. I think it's really important to understand what does each metric tell us and what are we trying to do, right? So yeah. I think ROAS, return on ad spend, is a pretty limited metric. It's important. We got to look at it. We measure it for every campaign, but it's limited, right? I think for a lot of people, 
more of like the CAC LTV equation is more important. So what, what does it cost to acquire a new customer? And mm-hmm. then what is a new customer work, worth to us over the next 30, 60, 90, you know, six months, whatever, um, and beyond. So that CAC LTV equation is really important. Um, but typically for clients, we're, we're looking at all of that, right? So clients say, hey, we want to be at a 200 return, 200% return ad spend, a 300% return ad spend, and we want to be at like a 50% new customer rate or whatever. So we're, we're looking at those things. When we drill down into specific campaigns, mm-hmm. then we're also looking at other metrics, right? So for YouTube, uh, ultimately, I want to look at, uh, hey, what what is what do engagements look like? Uh, what videos are people actually engaging with past you know the ten second mark? Uh, what videos are people clicking on? What is what is my CPC? Even though with with YouTube as an example, you're paying for the view, you're not paying for the click. Google's still going to calculate that click for you. What is my CPC and does that, how does that compare to other top of funnel efforts? So you want to kind of drill into those things as well. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's more about what are our business objectives and are our mm-hmm. campaigns properly supporting that? So, you know, another metric that a lot of people use is MER or media efficiency ratio. So that's kind of looking at, at global return on ad spend. So total money in, total money out, right? What are we, yep. what are we spending on all of our ads? Versus what are we driving in sales? And that's a good way to to kind of sanity check the numbers, right? Because yeah. you know, pre-iOS 14, everybody was taking credit for everything, right? If you if you totaled your Facebook ROAS and your your, your Facebook conversions and your Google conversions, you know, you were doing like double the revenue that you were actually doing because both both were taking credit for every sale. Now tracking is harder. And because of iOS 14, platforms have a, a, a more difficult time taking credit for conversions. Right. So now some platforms underreport what's happening, right? So if you if you look at that global number, total money in, total money out, or MER, that helps too. Because then you kind of can have guide rails of, hey, I, I always want my MER to be a 400% return ad spend or 300 or whatever. Right. And then at the campaign level, it's going to be less than that. But, but looking at that global number helps too. But I think it's more about, I'm a big believer in what are our business objectives. We want to grow by X. We, we want... X number of new customers or this percentage of new customer revenue versus returning. Um, and then and then you look at the right metrics to, to get you there. Sure. And so when you refer to MER, are you looking at that like quarterly? Is that annually? How do you typically track that? Yeah, I, th- I think you look at it almost on a daily basis, right? I, I okay. always caution people don't overreact to one day. Yeah. I still <laughs> like to see what's happened on a daily basis, right? But but ultimately, you, you know, you want to look more at at seven day, fourteen day, twenty eight day windows on on things like that. But I'm still looking at the numbers on, on the daily, you know, just just to see what. Got what's it. Yeah. yeah, I love that. And then you know, Brett, you know, really kind of like understanding like where and when and marketing is important, obviously. But when we're talking about like the what, right? Like. Yeah. As far as the type of content that you're putting out, that's obviously just mm-hmm. as important. So what are sort of like, you know, your your favorite types of content? Obviously, it probably like differs per channel, I would assume, right? Mm-hmm. And then probably, probably per brand, right? Per brand that you're working with, that could probably vary too, but just... Yeah. Yeah, great question. So it does depend. So I'll give you a few examples. We'll talk We'll talk YouTube a little bit. I, I think okay. a lot of the same things, that, and, I, and I'm a YouTube guy, so that's why I talk about it, right? You, yeah. YouTube and search and shopping. <laughs> But a lot of this applies to, to Facebook or, or other channels that involve video. I'll talk a little bit about display. And I think when, you know, my, my frame of reference is more like you, uh, Google discovery ads and Google display network, but the same thing mm-hmm. would apply to, you know, Taboola or Outbrain or native ads or, or, or even Facebook, that, that type of thing. But um, I, I think at the core, you have to look at, well, well here's what I think has happened to, to some brands. I think there was a period in time when the Facebook algorithm was amazing and it had yeah. all the data it could possibly want, too much data, right? Probably a scary amount of data if you if you look yeah. at this from a consumer lens rather than a marketer <laughs> right. lens. Like the marketer <laughs> in me is like, give me all the data. The consumer in me is like, hey, back off, buddy. Like, I, I don't want you to know everything that I do. Um, right. <laughs> so the algorithm had everything it could ever want. Um, and so really you could survive off of eh, so, so creatives, right? You just could. Um, now that things are harder, you really got to lean into to good creatives. So am I appealing to someone's self-interest? Am I really leaning into the benefits of the product? Why would somebody buy this protein shake versus another protein shake? Is it really that it's cruelty-free 
or is it more about best taste or is mm-hmm. it that it's easy on my stomach or whatever, right? Why would I choose this coffee over another coffee? What is it that, that appeals uh, to me most? And, and so, and making that clear, bringing that, you know, right up front where people see that. And then as best as we can, segmenting the message to the audience, you know, so message market match is super important. So let's talk YouTube for for a minute. I, I think, uh, you know, as you look at YouTube, you, the, the type of YouTube ads we run, they're called TrueView, meaning they're, they're the pre-roll ads. So you're there to watch your, your cat video or whatever. And uh, the skippable ad pops up, right? Right. Five seconds, you're forced to watch this video. Some people will view that ad. They'll They'll be mad. They'll curse under their breath. They get their <laughs> finger over the skip ad button. They're ready, They're ready it. for it. <laughs> but maybe, just maybe, that ad will hook them and they'll keep watching and they'll keep they'll keep engaging and maybe they'll even click through. So the key there is really in the hook. How do we get someone to stop and pay attention? So so we like to look at things like a pattern interrupt, right? What's what's something out of the ordinary, right? What's something a little bit different? Um, and then we like to get to a benefit very quickly. Um, so so you know a, a, a couple of good examples, a good pattern interrupt is. Did you ever see the the uh, poopery video from from I, of old? Yeah, I did. That was I think probably one of like the first like ad campaigns where I was just like. I just really kind of found myself being like so mesmerized by it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It was I mean, so there's no other way to say it. Just so like, totally, on, like yeah. watching it. Yeah. yeah it's, it's so good. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, the interesting thing about that ad is uh, the Harmon brothers made it. And I haven't seen it run recently. Poopri, I think shifted yeah. gears, but there was that opening scene. I hope this doesn't gross anybody out too bad, but the opening scene, <laughs> really pretty girl in a dress red hair. She's got a beautiful British accent. I think that was strategic because I think if you're going to talk about poo, you need to be classy as well. But anyway, she's sitting on a public <laughs> toilet in her, in her dress. And she says, you would not believe the mother load I just dropped. Right. And you're like, like wait, wait a minute. What? what? Like what is going on? So that that's like the extreme. You don't have to right. use humor. You don't have to, you know, and obviously not bathroom humor for most products, but <laughs> pattern interrupt girl in a dress in a public toilet talking about stuff, you know, you're not expecting in an ad that's a pattern interrupt, right? And then it, it weaves in the benefit and there's a combination of benefit and, and problem solution and then humor and then problem solution and humor. And that's kind of the way right. that, that works. So that's a good example, but you can also start with just a real, uh, real focus problem, right? Like we, we've got a, we got a client that sells low acid coffee uh, for people that have acid reflux or sensitive stomachs. There's a lot of people that love coffee, but can't drink it because of the acidity. So you know, there's a few different hooks and now I'm actually drawing a blank, but uh, hooks that are like, Hey, did you, uh, do you still love coffee, but you had to stop drinking it? Right. Or, or did, right. did your body change, but your coffee didn't, you know, there, there's some different, different hooks that we use like that. So the hook is super important. The hook is more important than anything else, but we talk about hook, then really focusing on, on the benefit, kind of a problem solution focus, nice product demo after that. So seeing the product in action. Uh, I, I'm from Missouri. Uh, our, our state animal is the donkey. Very charming. Uh, and we're also called the show me state. So it's like you, you have to show us. We don't believe you unless you show us. But that's a good that's a good example. It's a good frame of reference. Think about people from Missouri when you're making your ad. You have to show people. You can't just tell them. You got to prove it. So showing the, the the demonstration, we love then UGC or social proof, like seeing mm-hmm. reviews, seeing actual videos of actual customers, that type of thing, very, very important. And then offering, um, you know, a call to action, like, hey, go go and check out this thing, go see it in action here, go try a, try a sample, whatever the case may be. So, so that, that's super important. You know, that's all made much simpler if you're doing display or something. Uh, another, another, uh, a friend of ours runs, uh, this coffee business and they sell K cups. And so their top performing display ad is, uh, Hey, we, I almost threw out my Keurig until I found this, right? So they're instantly hooking someone. If we have, if you have a Keurig machine, you know, the coffee's probably not the best, right? And so maybe you're dissatisfied with your level of coffee. So you're about to throw out the Keurig, but you should maybe check this thing out first, right? So, so really getting that, that proper hook is, is the most important uh, element there. And then, and then everything else kind of comes after that, right? Audience targeting, the actual media, the way you bid, the way you, the way you track and, and things like that. So I don't know if that answered your question or if you have any follow-ups there, but 
Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And you said something interesting about, um, you know, really kind of relying on, um, you know, customer reviews on like, uh, you know, social proof, really kind of relying on like case studies. I feel like I see more and more brands, especially, you know, on Instagram, on TikTok, those channels, um, really kind of relying on that a lot more, right? They'll have someone make a video. I came across the other day, this, um, it's this like protein powder pasta, right? And it is, it's kind of one of those like, wait, what? It was a hundred percent. It was just a, it was a, you know, a, a scroll stopper for me. Yep. Um, yep. And it was, it was just that it was a girl who um, was just, I'm sure paid, right. Uh, to just sure. make this quick video, you know, in her kitchen of her like telling us all about this pasta. So, um, yeah. so I do, I feel like I've seen a lot more of that. Um, right. And I don't know if you've kind of seen that too uh, in, in the companies and brands that you're working with. Yeah, for sure. And, and it's one of our clients is Overtone. They're a coloring conditioner. So it's kind of the temporary color conditioner, but it's it's vegan. It's cruelty-free. It's like avocado-based or it's got avocados in it. So it's, it's healthy for your hair. But there, we have this video that we run where uh, there's this girl and she's holding like a, a you know a, a canister of the Overtone and it's like purple or something. And she's like, it happens. I'm coloring my hair today. And then, and then it, you know, so she's super excited about it. It's lots of emotion. Right. And then it shows like fast cuts. We got lots of content creators and real customers showing how they put it, how they apply it to their hair and then the results, right? So it's, it's both showing the benefit of, hey, I'd like to have blue hair. I want to have pink hair or whatever mixed with, oh, this is easy to use mixed with, oh, and it's it's vegan, it's cruelty-free, it's healthy. It's it's all those things. So so yeah, that that type of content I think it's going to continue to be uh, more and more popular because it's authentic, shows the product in use, shows real customers. It doesn't feel as much like an ad, right. which is important. Um, I do think, and especially on social, ads that don't feel like ads are super important, right? And, and I, I don't run yeah. traffic on TikTok or, or Facebook, but lots of friends that do. Um, YouTube, it can feel a little more like an ad and it's still okay, right? Like YouTube still feels a little more like TV right. where, you know, social platforms, especially TikTok, but also Instagram and, and Facebook, like it needs to kind of not feel like an ad. Right. Yeah. That's super interesting. Um, and, and yeah, I think I, I'm kind of curious now to just continue to sort of like look out for those. It feels less salesy, which I think. Right allows people to feel much less intimidated by the entire process. Right, right. So yeah, you, you got to realize that there's that sales resistance. So if you can lower right. that, we all want to buy stuff, right? Like like p consumers <laughs> love to buy things. And this became very clear during the pandemic, during lockdowns, like there was some retail therapy going on. People were, <laughs> people were yeah. afraid, people were depressed, people were whatever. They were buying stuff online a lot of that because they couldn't go to stores either, but there's retail therapy going on. Uh, there is sales resistance. So if you can, if you can make someone feel like, Hey, this is authentic. This is, this doesn't feel like an ad. And then if someone can see the ad and think that person's like me, right. That I, I can see myself using that product or doing that thing, right. They, they, someone needs to see themselves in the ad. Um, one, one of one of my favorite marketing quotes comes from a, this, this radio guy from a long time ago uh, named Roy Williams. He, he said that no one goes physically where they haven't first gone in their mind first, right? So you want to like paint this picture where someone is imagining what it's like if they buy the hair color, right? Or they're imagining what it's like if they buy the shake and they start feeling great and start losing weight. They, they want to imagine what it's like doing the, that that thing, you know, whatever, using your product. Right. And so so if you can do that in the ad, then they're, then they're more likely to actually do that in person. I love that quote. I feel like every marketer should just have that like posted somewhere. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> totally agree. Um, so to shift gears just a little bit, because I was digging through the site the other day um, and you mentioned, you know, obviously you guys do a lot of like the Google display ads, but you also have a, a pretty strong focus on uh, Amazon, right? Yeah. And so um, in kind of like thinking through, you know, <laughs> there's a lot going on with Amazon today. We don't have to, I don't know if anyone has enough time to <laughs> dig into all of that, <laughs> but yep. For you know, new or like emerging brands, do you think it's important for them to have some sort of a presence on Amazon? Like, should they, you know, sure they may have like their own, you know, standalone website, but do they or should they be on Amazon if they want to see any kind of success? So I, I think I think the way Amazon is now, you can't ignore it, right? You have right. to be very strategic. So if you're not going to be on Amazon, you need to have a good reason why. 
And, and sure. I do think there's a case to be made. I know several brands that built the brand off Amazon. So they they were good at traffic generation. They had they had a website that converted. They had a product that was great. They built up this brand, right? A couple of examples. Uh, one is Native Deodorant. Do you know Native Deodorant? Mm-hmm. And now, now yeah. they're beyond, now they're uh, shampoo and, and sun care and lots of other things. So uh, Moise Ali, uh, known him for a long time. We, we run all their Google and YouTube uh, to this day. They built their brand off Amazon, but then they later got on Amazon. What's interesting is that Moise is quoted as saying. I wish I'd got on Amazon earlier, right? Because they immediately saw a lift. And what we're seeing when we, when we take a brand that's really successful off Amazon and we put them on Amazon, we're seeing typically 10 to 15% lift easy, right? Easy. And yep. it usually doesn't cannibalize off Amazon sales because there's just, there's a lot of people that will only buy on Amazon, right? Like, yep. like think, think about your parents, right? Your parents are, are potentially in this category where they're like, nope. I don't trust other sites. Amazon's easy. That's where I want to buy. So, so you can get a sales lift there. Uh, another example, uh, Boom by Cindy Joseph. So shout out to my buddy, Ezra Firestone. Built a very successful brand. Uh, they we, we helped them launch on Amazon. So we built out all their, their Amazon business. Immediately created uh, you know about a 12%, 15% lift in sales with no cannibalization for, for, what's, uh, for their off Amazon business. So you have to consider it, right? It's it's 50% of all e-commerce sales. But I think it's a harder skill to build a business off Amazon, right? Because conversion rates are lower off Amazon. Mm-hmm. You got to have some kind of competitive advantage of either you got to know how to drive traffic or know how, you know, conversion rate optimization or ideally all of those things. So I, I really, I do like the brands where you can be successful off Amazon and then you launch on Amazon and now you can really just blow up. Uh, I think the other thing that, that that brands need to consider is I think the days are gone when you can just build a, a business on Amazon that's just product focused, right? That's not brand focused. I think that yeah. if you want to build a business that you can sell or scale, uh, you need to build a brand on Amazon, meaning where someone buys your product on Amazon, but then when someone asks them about that product, like, hey, where did you buy that? You know, uh, I'll give you an example. I, I started eating cleaner. So I'm, I'm eating millet now, which if you don't know what millet is, it's like quinoa, only maybe not as tasty. Um, <laughs> it's a rice substitute, right? So I'm eating a lot of millet because it's good for me. And anyway, uh, so I bought this. It's like called Anthony's Organics or whatever. It's a really cool brand. I found it on Amazon, but yeah. now I started shopping this brand off Amazon too because packaging is nice. The product was great. Reviews are really good. Versus, I can think of lots of stuff that I bought on Amazon. I got no idea what the brand is. I would never go look for that brand, right? The product was kind of eh, and and all I all, I only bought it because it was on Amazon, right? So you right. have to think about building a brand on Amazon. So that means product packaging. It means building out your listing. It means thinking about photography and video and and why should you exist? Why is your product better, right? So real merchandising and thinking about that. So. That's where we're seeing success, people that, that are actually building a brand on Amazon. But I guess I guess my my if I had to condense that into a short piece of advice, it's you can't ignore Amazon forever. Maybe you want to start off Amazon, but probably at some point you're gonna have to buddy up with Bezos and you're gonna have to make it happen. You have to do something on Amazon, most likely. Yeah. Be frenemies if you have to. Exactly. That's, that's interesting though, because I would almost think it's the opposite, right? I'd almost think it as a new business, uh, you know, maybe just because costs are lower, right? You're not having to, uh, you know, manage an entire site. You're not having to, or at least again, this is in my mind because I'm not a marketer. Um, you know, spend a ton on ads. You know, trying to drive traffic to your site. A lot of people kind of assume Amazon just sort of like naturally does that for you. Yeah. So, so it's a really good point. So the other the other piece that I would say there is, yeah, it is easier probably to build a brand to, or to launch a product on Amazon, right? There's sure. tons of traffic there. Conversion rates are really high. People know if they buy something on Amazon and don't like it, Amazon's going to return it or they can take it to Kohl's or whatever and return it. So so it's sometimes easier to to launch on Amazon but, but you still have to think about building a brand. And we, right. we have, it does seem easier to, once you have a brand off Amazon, to, to then launch on Amazon. 
than it is to launch on Amazon and then try to go D to C. Um, okay, pivot. Yeah, so it's so it's difficult because the you know the 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 economics are often different, right? You can't be you can't like launch on Amazon and be a low price leader with very thin margins and then try to go D to C off Amazon. That just doesn't usually work typically. But if you can launch off Amazon and then go to Amazon, that's almost always successful. Uh, but you are right. Like it, it's it's simpler, more straightforward to launch on Amazon and get and get sales quicker on Amazon. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's just harder it, to pivot later. Yeah, and it is. It's obviously too, right? If you want to be a successful brand, you've got to think long term, right? Sure, you can make a few totally. sales on Amazon in the first few months. Awesome. But then what? Yep. Right. Yeah. So yeah. And, and, and you know. Grow, Right. And I think most brands, there are a few brands we run into that they just want to build and be profitable forever. But a lot of brands want to sell, right? A lot of brands, you want to build up their brand and sell it at some point yeah. in time. And I know from you know, friends with a lot of private equity groups and people that are that are into mergers and acquisitions and buying brands. And yeah. if your business is more than 50% Amazon, you'll get less value for that, right? Versus if it's more 50-50 or even higher than 50% off Amazon, you'll get a higher valuation. Your business is more valuable to that potential investor, that potential buyer. So that's another reason to think about, let's let's do both, both on Amazon and off Amazon. That's a, an incredible piece of information to consider for any brand out there listening. I think that's, yeah, that's, it's something that again, uh, people just, I don't think, think about initially in the beginning. So, um, right. and, and kind of, you know, on that note too, then Brett, as far as, and this is a super loaded question, so I'm just going <laughs> to preface it there. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. Are you terrified yet? Um, uh, oh, oh, you know, we're just curious now, and I'm just super yeah. interested. This is going to be awesome. So I got I got you hooked. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, are there any like common mistakes that you find with brands or, you know, e-commerce retailers that, you know, they tend to make or anything that, you know, when you sit down with a company that you're considering taking on or considering working with, what's sort of like that common theme that you see where you just are sort of like, face palming. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so one of the mistakes that we see made is, is what I kind of talked about in the beginning of expecting all ad channels, all right. ad platforms to perform the same. They don't, right? If we look at Amazon as an example, you know, you got your sponsored product ads, which are the, you know, if you, if you search for a product on Amazon, uh, a lot of the results are ads, right? Just, it looks like a normal yeah. product listing, but it's an ad. Those perform very, very well, right? So, and they should. So comparing that to say Amazon DSP, which Amazon DSP uh, allows you to target people based on their Amazon shopping behavior, but you can target them on Amazon, off Amazon with display ads. Mm -hmm. Those aren't going to work the same, right? They're, they're going to they're gonna perform a little bit differently. So that's one of the mistakes. Uh, I think uh, another mistake is, you know, people um, try to, to use the same creatives across platforms, right? So we, we see this a lot where, Someone says, hey, I tried YouTube and it didn't work. Well, what did, what did you run there? Well, I took my Facebook ad and I put it on YouTube and it didn't work, right? And, and that, the, the pace, the length, the structure of a YouTube ad is different than a Facebook video ad in most cases. Right. Same can be said, and I'm not a TikTok guy, but I know you can't take your YouTube ad and just put it on TikTok. It doesn't work, right? So different mindset, different use case different platforms. You got to build your ad for the platform. That's another very common mistake. Uh, I, I think another thing people don't think about is, you know, a lot of the issues you may have, if, you, if your return on ad spend isn't what you want it to be, or your global mer isn't what you want it to be, it might not be the ads. It might be your page, right? It might be the landing page or your site. And so I think that's a big mistake where People just focus on new traffic or just focus on driving new customers. And they don't think about what am I missing on this landing page that's preventing a new shopper from becoming a customer, right? So, mm -hmm. so I think now, and especially as the economy gets weirder and ad costs go up, you got to focus on conversion rate optimization. So we're big, big believers in, you know, actual user testing and getting user feedback and doing split testing on you know, A-B testing on landing pages, all super, super important. So, so CRO is important. And then I think the other piece that people miss is, is they don't think about retention marketing and loyalty marketing enough. So, 
And hey, I, I love top of funnel traffic. I love seeing, you know, being able to scale a campaign on YouTube or seeing a campaign scale on Facebook. But you know what's even sexier at times is email. Like get it, what what if you could increase your email campaigns and your SMS campaigns uh, to where you're driving, you know, maybe you're driving 20% of your revenue now through email. What if that could be 40% of your uh, revenue through email? That's possible. And that's what a lot of successful e-commerce brands see. So I think, I think we're going to see that as well as the economy gets stranger and who knows what's going on with inflation and, and other things is leaning into retention marketing is yeah. going to become more and more important. So that comes down to list segmentation and getting really uh, thoughtful about the, you know, what content you're sending via email and subject lines and offers and all those things. So um, yeah, I, I think, I think it's thinking about retention as well. And then just, just not being lazy, right? I think, I think a lot of uh, agencies and marketers, it's easy to be lazy and good marketing is hard work, right? Like saying the right yeah. thing to the right person at the right time. It's hard, but it's supposed to be. And it's hard for your, your competitors too. And so if you're better at it, you're going to win more than they will. And that's, that's the name of the game. Yeah. It's interesting that you're saying email. Um, and I'm kind of that same way too. I sit down to sort of crank out some of our like copy for our campaigns. And there are just days where I'm just like, what, what am I going to write about? What do you yeah, just, yeah. Send an email that's 20% off subject line. Like that yeah. can work at times, but yeah. Are we using curiosity in our subject lines? And are we, are we driving, both opens and click throughs because your email service provider wants to see that, right? Your deliverability will go up if people engage more. Are we occasionally seeing an email that actually gets people to reply to it? If you see that some, your email service provider will love that, you know? So yeah, there are all kinds of things to do. And uh, email, it's so funny. Like uh, I've been in marketing a long time now and I don't, I haven't heard this in a while, but I used to, you know, every three or four years, people would be like, oh, yep, email's dead. Nope, nobody's gonna, no, my, my kids, <laughs> yeah. my kids don't use email. So eventually email will die. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense, right? Your kids don't use email because they don't have a job. But once people get a job, then everybody <laughs> uses email. And anyway, I don't I don't hear anybody talk about email being dead now. I think everyone has seen the light that email is probably here forever. Sure. But uh, I think it's, it's likely under leveraged for most brands. And that's something that brands need to fix. Super useful and valuable information. I'm really excited to... Uh to have not only other marketers, right, listen to this, right? You don't want them stealing all your secrets, but hearing a, a lot of our, our <laughs> Lots of business to go around, saying, so it's okay. Yeah. Steal, steal whatever I'm saying here. It's totally fine. No, it's it's incredibly valuable. So I'm, I'm really excited to, that you're able to come on, Brett. Um, and really, before we hop off, I just had a final question. I feel like, you know, everybody always asks, you know, what are you reading, right? And I feel like now the what are you listening to has kind of become the new what are you reading? <laughs> yeah, so for you, yeah. I know you have Spicy Curry. That's your podcast. Uh, so in addition to your own podcast, are there any others that... <laughs> Or, I, mean, I just listen just to listen myself. To I, I really, I, I don't think anyone else has good advice. I listen to my own podcast yeah. and that's it. Uh, no, actually, so actually I do have uh, spicy curry, which is, which is a new podcast. It's, it's series based. I think I've got eight episodes. I also have e-commerce evolution, which I've been doing since 2017, got just it. recorded like, uh, or just published the 200th episode not long ago, uh, which is awesome. So check, check those both out. All e-commerce focused, but big names on there like Ezra Firestone, Mickey Agarwal from Tushy. She's phenomenal. She's brilliant. Um, so yeah, do check those out. But uh, I I love listening. Uh, I am an auditory learner. I retain well when I listen. So I when I'm when I'm driving, I'm listening to Audible. I'm listening to podcasts. So I'll give you a couple of examples. This is not a recent one, but I think this ties into uh, what we've been talking about here. Uh, there's a great book called Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller. It's a great audio book. And, and really, he talks about how do you tell your story as a brand in a compelling way? And he he's an author, written a lot of books, but he kind of compares good ads to good storylines. And anyway, you got to listen to the book. It's fantastic. In terms of podcasts, there are several that I listen to. For like e-commerce and retail news, I love a, a show called the Jason and Scott Show, and mm -hmm. that's Scott with one T, not two T's. It's it's a great it's a great podcast. Um, I also love e-commerce fuel. Shout out to my buddy Andrew Udarian. It's all about e-commerce and then e-commerce influence. Another buddy Austin Bronner. So shout out to those guys. So th those are great podcasts. 
Um, and then, and then, you know, I'm like a lot of entrepreneurs. I'll listen to occasionally to the Tim Ferriss uh, podcast or, or Jocko sure. Willink. That guy's awesome too. Um, but yeah, I'm always listening to something. Um, and just started a new book at, at the recommendation of a business coach called a nonviolent communication, which is a, <laughs> a really weird title. Um, but sure. I'm just getting into it and it's super interesting. So. We'd assume that most communication would hopefully be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But it's actually about how to have hard conversations um, that still have emotion in them, but don't anyway. Yeah. It's, so it's, I'm, I'm barely into it, but it, it's interesting so far. Super interesting. I love that. I'm going to have to check those out. I listen to podcasts and, and audiobooks when I'm at the gym. And some people nice. think that's super weird instead of listening to the actual music. But, but, um, but you're getting better. You're getting smart. You're building your body and you're building your mind. I, I love it. I love it. Keep, keep so, doing it, Jamie. Don't let anybody tell you that it's a BOGO. <laughs> it's a BOGO. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you again so much, Brett. It was great having you on. Where can people find you? Yeah. So the easiest way is at omgcommerce.com. That's that's the, the agency site. So if you have questions, we have resources, like there's a, a top YouTube ads guide. If you want to see, you know, what are the, some of the top performing YouTube ads right now? It's a free guide. I've got blogs and resources, got stuff on Amazon. So omgcommerce.com. I am on the socials. So LinkedIn, connect with me there. Facebook, that's fine too. And uh, yeah, would love to connect. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Thanks, Jamie. This was awesome. You're a great interviewer. Keep it up. This was really good. All right, guys. Thanks again so much for tuning in to another Modern Merchant Podcast episode. If you want to learn more about us, check us out at flexpoint.com. That's flexpoint without the e.com. We've got our Modern Merchant blog up there. It's full of the latest e-commerce information and news. Also, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on socials at Flexpoint. We'll see you again next week with another episode.